Now then, you're very welcome back. Happy to say Stuart Lancaster has joined us in studio. You are very welcome. Great to see you again. Thanks, Joe. Thanks for coming in. So we reached out to you when uh, news came through of the move to Paris and said, come in and have a chat about it at your leisure. And so here you are, a bit of a, a semi-downtime in so much as you get downtime. <laughs> so, uh, well, I guess congrats are in order. I mean, it's a great move and I'm sure one you're very excited by. How did all this come about? Uh, it was interesting, really. I mean, I... They uh, approached me via a, an agent in probably June, just at the end of the season. Mm. Um, and um, I guess what people wouldn't know is that in 2016, um, post-World Cup for me, post and pre-Leinster, I actually did a, um, a consultancy piece for Racing. Um, uh, maybe it was April, I'd say, April 2016. Um, and... Uh, um, Lauren Travers, who's still there now, and Lauren Beat um, asked me in, and I basically went through the lessons I'd learned from coaching England, but also did some assessment of their playing style and how they were going and how I'd try and beat them if I was a coach. Um, so I think that was maybe in the back of their minds. And obviously the the Racing Leinster final, 2018, the obviously for Leinster's progress. Um, and, uh, yeah, this guy said, you know, we'd be interested in going. Um, they, they want you to come. They don't want anyone else. Um, and so for the first time, really, in seven years, six years, seven years, um, I thought, I wonder whether this is worth pursuing or not, you know. So I just discussed it with the agent a little bit more. Uh, he was the middleman, effectively. And then I had a Zoom call uh, with um, Lauren Travers, who's the current head coach, and Yannick Nyanga, uh, who's a back row, who's on the coaching team. Um, and uh, they sold it very well, to be fair. Um, uh, the premise was that Lauren Travers... Um, whose current head coach was going to become the president and that the president, Jackie Lorenzetti, was going to um, step down from that role to give him more time for his family and his other businesses. Um, you know, he's 74, Jackie now. And they wanted a head coach. So it's pretty unique in sport that um, a team makes a decision a year out from actually want to, wanting it to happen. Uh, in fact, I can't really think of another time. So obviously you've got a bit of time to think it over during the summer. You know, I discussed it with Leinster. Um, I went across for a visit, met... I'd been to the training ground before, um, obviously played against them. Um, I'd been to the Defence Arena, which is the indoor stadium where they play. Um, so I had a rough idea, but obviously it was less so about the... It was about the rugby. It was about, obviously, leaving Leinster. Um, but it also it was about, like, is this the right time um, to do it as a coach? What's the impact on the family? Which is, obviously, number one. So we had a bit of time to think about it on the, during the summer break for Leinster. And... Uh, um, ultimately, the uh, the decision got made um, probably you know August September time, um, but not without a long long period of thought and reflection and you know is it the right time etc cetera, etc cetera. and and ultimately as it happens in France usually um, it broke in the French media obviously it came over here um, but um, I announced it to the playing group at Leinster um, and the staff uh, and and since then I was glad that that day was over to be honest um, since then. It's been very much business to use it at Leinster, you know, and uh, ironically we play Racing in Europe. I know. <laughs> I'd like to have been in the room when that draw was made. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Did you tune fro? Yes. Oh, massively. God, massively, massively. I mean, to, you know, I'm leaving, in my opinion, one of the best, if not the best, you know, environments to work in, um, in world rugby. I mean, it's an amazing place to work. You know, fantastic people, incredibly happy, love Dublin, love living here. Um, uh... Knowing, knowing that there's more potential in the group, you know, look at the age profile of the group, you know, there's some really good young players coming through. Um, feeling that there's unfinished business, you know, with not having nailed all the finals and semi-finals we've been in. Um, but obviously on the other side, you've got this pull of challenging yourself in a different environment as a coach, you know, going to live not a million miles away from home, but, you know, in a completely different country, learn the language um, and try and build a, a team that's, close to what Leinster have, you know, they've got a good academy at Racing, um, they've obviously got talented players, mm. um, but they've never quite got across the line other than once, I think that, that year, 2016, so um, yeah, lots of two in a row. And what swings it ultimately in the direction of Paris? Probably the challenge, okay. probably the challenge it, just, it was just too too hard to turn down in terms of like challenging myself as a leader and as a coach um, to go back to a number one position um, you know, to be head coach um, to build a team, to try and integrate my learnings from England and from Ireland into the French way, 
Mm. I think in four years' time I'll be a better coach. As I said to the players, hopefully I can come back at that point. Or you know, who knows what happens in four years' time? But uh, you know, I'd still be you know fifty six, fifty seven years old. I'll still be plenty of coaching left in me. Mm. Um, and I think I want to finish my career as a coach, having experienced different environments and challenged myself in different ways. And this probably was never gonna come again in the way it came. Mm. So that desire to be a head coach again at some stage was always there as well as things were going at Leinster. Yeah, yeah, but not that wasn't the driver. I was very happy working underneath Leo. Mm. Um, you know, it wasn't it wasn't because I wanted desperate to do that. It's probably the lure of like the top fourteen. It's such an exciting league. You know, you look at if you're not playing La Rochelle, you're playing Lyon. If you're playing Lyon, you're playing Toulouse, you're playing Toulon. It's it's big stuff over there in France. And as a coach, you know, it's like jumping into the deep end. You know, I listen to Rog, you know, when you guys speak to Rog and you know, he sort of probably did it the sensible way, you know, assistant coach at Racing, off to Crusaders, assistant coach at La Rochelle, now head coach, you know, learns the language, learns the culture, environment, and I'm like, straight, straight in, in. Yeah. straight in. But, uh, you know, I've got some experience, you know, a fair amount of experience now as well. Um, and I think the the bit that I'll feel most comfortable with will be the coaching. The bit will be the most challenging will be the management of the staff, the management of the playing group, the the cultural shift for me, you know, working in a different country, living in a different country, the language barrier, et cetera, et cetera. So, but, um, yeah, it was the challenge, really. It was too hard to turn down. There is obviously a, a transitory nature to professional sports. When you announce to the room that you're heading off, do you get an emotional outpouring and hugs, or is it OK? Uh, the emotion came from me. <laughs> Did it, yeah? Yeah, yeah, definitely. No, no, I really struggled to tell them. Um, because I love them to bits, you know, all, all the player group, you know, whether it's the, the players I've coached who've left, um, and the players who are there, the youngest players who are just beginning to come through, the staff, you know, genuinely, genuinely, really got a strong bond with them all, really. There's not one, not one I would look at and say, you know, I don't want to yeah. continue a relationship with them. So, so it was more from me, but for them, um, I'm, you know, I'm confident that Leinster is set up in a way that, you know, there's going to be success following my departure, sure. for sure. You know, I think, I think there's a lot of strong leadership group there's great knowledge um, and an understanding of how we want to play there. The, the conveyor belt of talent is there. Um, so it will be different, obviously, with a different coach coming in. Mm. But there's, you know, it's probably a good thing anyway. You know, there's a sort of like... Freshness to it. The freshness to it, yeah, yeah definitely for them. Um, uh, you know, I look at, say, is it the seven-year itch for me? Is it, is it the right time, seven years? I look at Liverpool and, you know, and I think about that. And yeah. Leo and I t would talk about it all the time, you know, when's... When's the right time? And um, who knows, it's the right time. We'll find out. Hindsight's a yeah, exactly. painfully good <laughs> exactly. judge. Yeah. And did you, when you, as a matter of interest, when you knew you were telling them or walking into the room to say, listen, I'm, I'm, I've made this decision, did you anticipate I'm going to get emotional here or did it catch you as you were, the reality uh, of saying it almost? I, I've had to do it a couple of times in my career. Mm. Um, and every time I prepare for it properly, but every time it catches me. Like when I left Leeds, it sounds, you know, back in 2007, um, I was coach of Leeds, my home club. Um, the uh, the RFU came in and offered me the role of head of elite player development, um, and uh, yeah, I really struggled right. on that occasion. You know, England was different. Obviously, you know, it was, it was sort of the game finishes and suddenly you, you don't get a chance to say goodbye to anyone. You know, and that's sort of still um, it's upsetting really because there's so many relationships that I had, not just with players but with people at the RFU, um, council members, the board. Um, people at my PA, people who supported me right the way throughout. Yes. You know, you just didn't. I just didn't. Never, I never walked so, back in the building. It's very striking. So these are very genuine relationships to you, because some coaches, I suspect, by necessity, because they have to drop players and get rid of players, they don't allow themselves get emotionally close. So clearly, that's not your modus operandi. You're, you're creating real relationships. Yeah, yeah, and, and maybe, you know, biggest strength, biggest weakness. You know, um, that's the debate you could have with coaches. Um, you know, the guy who stands apart and stands distant, um, um, perhaps they're better to lead because they don't get involved with the emotional of the decisions. Um, but equally, I think there's always been a bit of me like, uh, you know, I want to, to work for the players to help them get better as people as well, you know what I mean? So you can't help but mm. talk about things outside of rugby or talk about life or pass on your experiences. And then, like, when you've been at Leinster for six, this is now my seventh year, um, and you've coached them for you know, now on 45 weeks a year and you stand in front of them on three times a week, you've got games for 30 of those 45 weeks, you know, you can't help but share experiences together, you know, winning change rooms, losing change rooms. But I've watched, 
some of the best players in that room go from academy players to international players. I've watched them go from 20-year-old to 27-year-olds and get engaged and married. You know what I mean? The whole thing, you know, you see the full mm. life, st life story of them. Um, so you can't help but get close to them. Um, but not in such a way you can't make tough decisions. But for me, being a number two, it's obviously easier to be slightly closer than you maybe would be if you were Leo, because he's the guy that's, you know, saying you're not playing this week or whatever. Um, and obviously that'll be different for me mm. going into into France. You know, I'll be the guy saying, this is the team this week, this is the team for a, for a big game, and, and some lads, you know, probably won't be as close to me. I'm sure. <laughs> there is, um, uh, I guess it's a touch cliché, but there is a perception of a French dressing room and the culture they're in for instance I don't know if you read it or not Bernard Jackman uh, wrote a piece in yeah, the Sunday no, Independent I, a couple of weeks ago it was an open letter to Stuart Lancaster yeah. here's some of the things I found and it made for interesting reading for instance he was saying uh, it's important to put your stamp on things but don't try and win every battle the French live to eat rather than eat to live meals and meal times are very important they love long lunches and even the odd glass of wine with lunch or dinner is not frowned upon so there was a degree of <laughs> listen you're going to see some things which maybe not strike you as uh, best practice, but you've got to pick your battles. So um, what is your sense of a French dressing room? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I mean I've spoken to Bernard as well, so he was, uh, he was good with his time. I spoke to quite a few people who've coached in France who, um, mainly Irish, actually. Um, I spoke to Mike Prendergast, actually, after the game, um, the Munster game that weekend. Um, obviously, he was there. Um, so, um, yeah, it is different. It is different. And certainly being around the environment at Racing, um, it'd be it'd be it'd be different, and when you speak to Yannick Nyanga and Dimitri Sazeski and and Laurent in particular, they actually say we actually want a little bit of what you have anyway, you know. And obviously the balance, the, the trick for me is to find the balance between, you know, not making it truly like the way I would have it, but but more more very rigorous on detail and 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 better in terms of training habits and and you know one one of the things that you know I want to really concentrate on is is coaching them well you know what I mean I really believe that if if you've got a good team and, and Racing should have a good team you know with recruitment it's different to Leinster because you know Leinster's 95% homegrown and you know they come through the system the academy and the senior team are a little bit more disconnected at Racing and I'd like to connect that together um, pr bring through some more of the young um, talented players um, involve them in the team meetings you know have more I hesitate to say study, but you're more more rigor in terms of like detail, mm. um, but not take away the French DNA, you know. Um, and you know, I'm learning quickly, you know, about what battles to to fight and what not to. And I think I'm probably experienced enough now to know um, when when to pick those. But there's probably still be times I'll need to put my foot down and say no, this is the way we're doing it. Other times I might need to sort of um, loosen off. But uh, I think they're ready. They want to change. They mm. deliberately wanted someone from outside of France um, to come in. Yeah. Um, so that was their preference. And obviously, I guess because of the relationship back in 2016, maybe they thought, yeah. you know, I was the right person. Well, they do seem at a point where they're, they're acknowledging that there are um, good ideas outside of the country. Like the Sean Edwards effect, I'm sure, has been noted by every club. So it could be a, a good time to go in in that respect as opposed well, to crossed arms and what, it was, what do you yeah. know? But I mean, Ireland are number one in the world. You know, Len Leinster, uh, um, you know, constantly there or thereabouts in Europe. You know, they play great rugby. We, you know, we lost against La Rochelle in the final, but Toulouse, who'd be one of the best, better teams in France, you know, we beat in the semi-final in an amazing performance. And, yes. pe you know, people in France watch those performances and yes. they recognise the quality that's, that's happening over here. Um, and they want to tap into that. And, you know, that's part of the, the thing, isn't it? You know, you leave one country, like I leave England, um, having been developed through their system and pass on what you've learnt to mm. to Ireland, really. And in a you know, you know, you do coach development sessions or you're coaching players and the trickle down effect tends to happen. And then, you know, now the same will happen, you know, not consciously. I'm not helping France beat Ireland. I certainly don't want that to happen. But uh, but I'd want I'd want to um just pass on what I've learnt, you know, and that's that's you know, it sort of happens by us osmosis really. Racing have a reputation uh, and, and warranted for playing expansive rugby and stylish rugby and with flair and I, I suspect they looked at some of the Leinster performances and said well you know that fits in with how we see ourselves is that part of the attraction for you you say well this is yeah. a, a kind of ethos that I recognise and I like yeah definitely yeah. definitely and you know when you see that uh, that indoor arena and you look at you know how you know you've got no wind you've got no rain you've got an ast you know fantastic surface to play on there's a disco afterwards. There's a disco, there's disco before. There's a disco afterwards. <laughs> the bars go on the field, apparently. Um, but um, hopefully I'll be home by then. <laughs> um, but um, 
but yeah, no, that that's exciting. You know, I wouldn't want to go and to a club that was you know built on you know a box kicking style or sure. um, you know Leinster. You know, we, we would strive to play to space. We'd try to you know play a Leinster DNA, mm. um, and we'd score you know nearly hundred odd tries a season. You know, typically, and so you know, if I can do that in France, it's more difficult because. The, the style of rugby is different, you know, the the, the wet weather rugby game, uh, the big powerful packs, you've got to win by by grinding as well during the tough months. Mm. So we've got to have that inside us, but also um, the games, the finals, I also say at Leinster as well, you know, the finals are in May, June and July. So, yeah, sometimes it's tough. You know, we've got scallops away this Friday. Um, it could be raining down there in Wales on a late November evening. But, you know, we've still got to develop a style that will help us play in the finals. You mentioned there you referenced the intensity of the league and it's relentless and it's week in and it's week out. And there's times O'Gara's on the line there and he looks tired because he's working bloody hard. Yes. So did you ever consider I'm going to take a sabbatical and recharge? Um, Will it be every bit as intense as Leinster? Because it's easy to look at the URC and say there are at times less demanding weeks. Leinster so dominant at times, whereas that won't be the case in the, the top 14. Are you anticipating a physical, emotional challenge that will be, you know, treadmill-like? Or, or what are your thoughts on all that? Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, in answer to the first question, there was, I can't remember who said it now, but I can rest at the end. That was the that was the sort of... I can't remember who said it now. There was uh, a great coach, and he, he said, he said, well, what about taking a rest? He says, no, no, I'll rest at the end. And I, I'm definitely in that mindset, you know, right. I want to keep on going. And um, in terms of the... Um, yeah, that was the, probably the biggest consideration, if I'm being honest. So... I'd sort of, I'd said, I tried to explain it to my wife. I was like, you know, if 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 your job is taking you to eighty percent capacity of what of your personal capacity is, mm. and then you've got I don't know um, family things to deal with, or you know you've got because everyone's got other stuff outside of work, haven't they, to deal with? Um, if that's close to ninety or ninety five percent, and there's maybe only five percent left for like your personal space to just recharge your batteries and whatever else, then that's just about doable. But if you, if your job's taking you to ninety ninety five percent. And then the family's taking you, and all the other demands you know on your life takes you to a hundred or hundred and five percent. You know that's and that was always the biggest consideration for me. You know, can can I maintain the job so it doesn't completely consume my life? Um, to leave enough time for for Nina, you know, to come across to live in to live in Paris and to make her feel settled, and you know, then my son's in trying to um, develop his rugby career, at Ealing in London. My daughter's up in. Um, Newcastle, my mum's 80 years old on a farm in Cumbria on her own you know, it's all these pieces of the jigsaw and that's not even including like any mates or, or yes. things that you do, yes. who, you know brothers or sisters, you know you've got all those things and um, you know, you're trying to do your best for everyone who who's around you family and friends and they're super excited about the job and I'm sat there thinking, jeez, I'm going to France mm. I don't speak the language um, I'm going to a big club. There's 30 odd games a year, including Europe. Um, but but uh, having weighed all that up, I still felt, and obviously I had to have Nina's support. Yeah. Um, uh, that w- yeah, we can do this. We can do this. But I, I feel the worry is is that it, it, it'll it'll be. And I, so I, but I've I learned with England, I think more so than anything that um, because that was probably you know again the tipping point really in terms of like the divans. Um, to get good people around you, number one, sure. and certainly to get people in the management and the management side of things that can take that stuff away, which means I can concentrate on the coaching. So, key priorities for me is you know if Laurent Tavers is going to become the president, obviously making sure he looks after recruitment and sure. everything else. I've got uh, hopefully a general manager that I'd like to bring in. There's already a team manager, you know, so surround myself with good people who can look after all that stuff, which means I'm back to eighty percent of right. I'm on. Then I've got the the remaining capacity to to tr- commute backs and forwards or um, or whatever. And will you be on the pitch in the same way that you are with Leinster? Is that how you see it? Yeah, yeah, I'll be head coach. Head coach, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that was, and that, yeah. yeah, and that was the um, the absolute proviso for me. Like, right. there was no way I would have left Leinster to not coach. OK. Um, so, no, it'd be exactly the same role. Um, the difference being, um, which obviously adds to the, the weight of the role, um, is the selection decisions. You know, ultimately, the contract decision will come down to me. You know, are you staying, are you going... Are you getting a pay rise or a pay cut or whatever? So that's obviously more demanding. Um, but but I'm confident, you know, to, to have the capacity to cope with that with the people around me to do the logistical side of things, let's call it. Uh, and, you know, the people who I know 
who I'm hoping to bring in. Well, one of them I was I've known for 25 years. He lived in France for 25 years. He probably be my translator as well as general manager until I've sort of learnt the language. Um, I think um, the coaching team, obviously, you know, do you do you bring in your own coaches? Do you bring in your own head of athletic performance? Your own physios? Your own doctor? Do you you know your own analysts? Um, but my approach really has been to sort of let's go with what we've got. Um, uh, and I will work hard within integrate myself into their system and try and bring my thoughts and processes to them, um, but give myself the um, the opportunity to move or change over the course of one to two to three years. Do you know what I mean? Same. I do. These are the interesting dilemmas. I mean, David Moyes would be a good man to talk to <laughs> when he went in at Manchester United. He brought in all his own people and got yeah. rid of some of the um, yeah. the mainstays and. Yeah. Well, everything he did is a mistake in hindsight. It's yeah. hard to know what actually was and wasn't a mistake. But for instance, that was pointed to as well, yeah. getting rid of Mike Phelan and these guys. Yeah. Maybe that's exactly. not a good idea. So yeah. these are all, all yeah, these Yeah, I mean, decisions. you've got Dimitri Sarzeski and Yannick Nyanga as an example, two you know, legends of yeah. of racing. You know, I'm not going to get rid of those two for a start. You know, I'm going to build a relationship and work with them. You Wouldn't know? be popular either. I mean, you don't want to come in and... Well, there's no, there's, no, there's no need. You know, my, my mindset is to go and work with what's there and then ultimately... They have to be open-minded and, you know, obviously when I went across, I met them individually and just said, you have to be. And they're all, you know, nodding their heads and saying, yep, we are, we're ready, you know, we're going to do something different. Um, so let's see, you know, let's see, but that'll be all to me. What has been the nature of family time over the last six years then? Because I hear, well, you're back and forth is what I hear. I don't, I'm kids scattered and you mentioned your mum as well. So has, yeah. it, has it been very doable or...? Um, it's probably got less doable. <laughs> Oh. Bizarrely. Uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, so when I came to Leinster, my kids were um, 15 and 16. Um, and um, they were just going through school and doing A-levels. So it was never the right time for them to move to Ireland. And Nina obviously was busy, you know, with them and everything else, their sport and everything else that's going on. And obviously the commute, you know, the flights were great and everything was mm. is easy, you know, um, or easy enough. Um I said to the lads when I um, announced I was going, you know, I was actually, it was on, I was about 12.30 that morning a.m. <laughs> on the tarmac at Leeds Bradford Airport with half of Leeds United's Irish fans. Um, <laughs> and I've, I must take 150, 160 flights a year, you know, I'd say minimum, you know, lead back and forth to Leeds Bradford. Um, um, but I've never once sat there on that rainy tarmac in Leeds thinking, I don't want to do this, you know what I mean? Never once that. And Nina's never once, you know, never not wanted me to do it. But um, anyway, so, you know, you get through school, then, you, then you're on to university, um, and I'm, I'm into sort of year three, year four of Leinster. Mm. Um, and then COVID comes, um, and then I'm either... I'm, well, I'm, over, I'm in the UK for a period, but now I'm back, and because Leinster have got going again, albeit there's no crowds, and, and I'm not going home, and I've not gone home, I didn't go home for, for three, four months, you know, couldn't get home. Nina came out once or twice testing and all that sort of stuff. Mm. Kids are going through university um, and the flights never really sort of synced back in, you know, and the Leeds Bradford flights have never been as good recently. Um, the kids have now left home. So poor Nina's on her own at, at home. I'm on my one bedroom flat in Rock Mines on my own. Um, and we're both sat there thinking, we need to be together now, you know, yeah. like it's not fair on Nina really. Um, so part of the rationale really again was to was to do that because the kids have now flown the nest, so to speak. Um, and uh, it's been harder to to get home and back, you know, on, on, the, on the days off here and there. Um, uh, so, yeah, but that's that's the nature of you're either in or you're... Mm. You can't be half in. Mm. You're either in or you're not in. And um, You must have moments in the midst of all that. Oh, sorry, the other thing, yeah, the other thing. My on. dad passed in, in, in 20... 2018 and um, my mum, like I say, you know, you, yeah. you, people, you know, you, she's now on her own, mm. on a farm in Cumbria, and you're desperately trying to help her and get back up there, and and then you're up to see your daughter in Newcastle, but you're actually you Facetime and everyone ultimately, mm. um, and you're missing big moments. Um, so, so yeah, tough, tough, it's but tough. yeah, yeah, must, it's, you must think to yourself, God, is this worth it? Uh, no, I never think that, and, and they never think that. Right. They never think that. You know, we're very good at like connecting and spending time together and enjoying each other's company and um you know i'd speak to them you know all, all of them every day at some point okay um uh but um uh yeah it's a challenge it's a challenge it's a challenge but but the on the on the flip side of that 
you've got this amazing family in in Ireland, you know, of Leinster players and coaches and stuff. Um, the people have been amazing, you know. I well, can, you, I can, I can, I can drift out in, to in a, to, a, to a bar and and you know, I won't be short of people to chat to. Well, in a way, like of, of all of those um, participants there in the Lancaster family you talked about, I mean, your deal's okay. I mean, you're surrounded by people and, and great job, and it's very engaging. I'd say there's almost a guilt of, you know. Yeah. My wife's at home lonely, or I haven't seen my mother in X number of weeks, yeah. and God, that, yeah. that's the one that would. Yeah, and that, and that, yeah, and that's, and that's, you know, certainly with Nina, she's she's got her online business, she's just boot camps and everything else. She's got a great circle. Yeah. Um. Um. And that's why it's worked so well. Mm. But obviously now the kids are a bit older, um, and you know I want to try and watch Dan play where, where when I can. Of course, yeah. Um. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. You know, so so I mean one thing I. Sophie's got narcolepsy. I put it on um, LinkedIn not so long ago, World Narcolepsy Day. So she's a sleep disorder. So, you know, it's it's tough, you know, for her, you know, trying to get through university, get down into a full-time job and um, trying to explain the challenges of a sleep disorder like narcolepsy to people. Um, so she's trying to battle her way through that as well, you know what I mean? You're there, yeah. you want to help her, you know. So, so yeah, it's, it's, it's life. You know, I'm not like, you know, not poor me type thing because there's decisions we've made and... Um, and certainly the kids are 100 percent behind this decision, and uh, but we'll all massively miss Ireland. Mm. Uh, how do you navigate the passing of your father? Well, I mean, I don't think you ever do really. I don't think you ever do. You know, it was it was sudden. Um, it was cardiac arrest on the farm. Um, it was, you know, it was two months after he was at the Aviva with. Me, a photo with me and two trophies, we just won the double. Um, so, um, you know, you're constantly thinking, oh, give me dad a ring, give me dad a ring, and, you know, you, he's not there, obviously. Um, so, but you also know in the back of your mind, you know, he'd want you to do what you're doing. You know, he'd say to me. You know, he was the one that probably, you know, I'm, um, I, I took the inspiration from his hard work, his work ethic, his, his getting up to milk the cows at six o'clock in the morning, his work of them on Christmas Day and New Year's Day and... Um, and I did his eulogy and I said, you know, he's very, very good at the sort of guided discovery. You know, he didn't tell you what to do, but he sort of pointed you in the right direction. And so, you know, that's the sort of influence he's had on me. And, you know, also to this day, you'd still you know, be guided by him, really. There's an odd question people often ask after uh, that awful moment that unfortunately probably comes to most of us or all of us is like, did you give yourself time to grieve? As if there's a window I can set aside and, and that's it, boxed away. Or, or, or what does that entail? I don't know. But I'll ask the question nonetheless. Did you give yourself time to grieve? Yeah, yeah no, I mean, you know, Leinster were very good because it was the start of the season. Um, and, uh, you know, Leo just said, just take what time you need, you know. Mm. Um, you know, obviously I got a good glimpse of the Irish culture because, you know, Leo, Johnny... They came to the funeral, you know, they came all the way across from Dublin to Manchester Airport, hired a car, uh, guys, you know, they, all, they came up, John Fogarty, they came, they came up to, to to Penrith and stayed in a little Premier Inn and they're in this tiny little village in Colgate, round full of people and then Johnny Sexton walks down. Did you know he was going to be there? Uh, he said he was going to come and I said, listen, Johnny, you don't have to come. I mean, I think Laura just, you know, I think they were having another child at the time. I said, Johnny, you honestly, you don't have to come. And he was like, no, nah, I'll be there. So, so yeah, you know, obviously that means a lot. Mm. Um, uh, what you know, the effort that people make, um, and uh, um, yeah, so yeah, yeah, of course you grieve. And but Leinster were a very good game at the time. But equally, I needed to get back to work. I needed to. I need to get on with it. You know, I needed to. My dad would have said the same. He'd like, come on, Stu, you know, you need to, you need to go. Mm. So yeah, so it's a tough time. But um, and it's more the loneliness now for the mum. Your, your mum really. So, yeah. It's always horrible terrain. Um, does it feel very good to you that he saw things go so well at Leinster and oh, saw yeah. that's important? Very, very. Because, because like, I remember I forget after the World Cup in 2015, um, uh, my mum said to me, and everyone's writing nasty stuff about you in the press or, you know, this, that and the other. Uh, and she said, I just want to protect you. I said, I know, you know, um, you know, my son, and you're old enough to look after yourself. He said, but a mother's instinct is to want you to to protect you. You know what I mean? And I can't do that. And my dad said the same. He said, we can't. But when I actually realised the pain I was causing them, that was probably the tipping point. When 
you know, it wasn't cut and dry that I was definitely going to leave at the time. You know, there was a review and I had a debate with the CEO and me and Richie. Um, and uh, I was like, this is causing too much pain here, like for everyone. Um, on the back of, you know, a couple of games, you know, and you're thinking, geez, there's a more to life than this. Yeah. And actually, so it was the best thing, you know, to... And they were really uh, happy I'd come to Ireland. Obviously, I was out of England. Um, you know, I could... They could come over. Um, and, you know, the, there's a very similar feeling in the north of England, in Cumbria in particular, you know, the farming community, that my dad felt when he came here. So he was very, very happy, mm. comfortable. Do you know what I mean? And could see you were happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. That was the main thing. Yeah. And obviously, two of one as well. You know, that competitive side in parents... You know, they've been like, yeah, well done, you. Well, there's a degree of like, my bloody son is a bloody good coach. Yeah, exactly. Completely exactly. rehabilitated. Exactly. It's, a, it's the same that. with your kids and your wife and, and everyone who cares about you, you know. Um, but, you know, I'll forever be grateful to Lens. I've said this before, mm. you know, for the opportunity to do that. Because at the time, I was actually spoken to a coach today who's um, uh, in one of the clubs in England who've just been put into administration. And he said, um, what would your advice be? I said, you need to get a job again. So, you know, you need to find a purpose again because I had this period of, like, November 2015 to September 2016 when I came to Leinster of bits and pieces, but like no real purpose to a day. You know what I mean? It was driving me absolutely mad. I'm and sure. also because then, you can never stop looking in the rearview mirror at, at what's happened. You know, you can't look forward to anything. You're always looking back. And and then when you're at Leinster, you're like, right, we've got a game, we've got a game, we've mm. got a game. And then and then we we lost in two semis and we won the double. And and then every week, that's why. When people say to me, oh, well, you know, would you fancy international coaching again? I'm like, well, I should really enjoy club coaching. I know you talk about the volume or the intensity of fixes in France, but I'm like, how good is that? You know, yeah. with international coaching, you go through... I was being to Felipe, who's now obviously with Argentina, and uh, he's got the games in November and he's loved it. He's done the rugby championship. And then I said to him, so what are you going to do between November and July? Because that's the next game. And he's a bit like, yeah, that's a good question. Mm. That's a good question. How do you keep developing as a coach? And like I said to... Um, the lads, the Leinster lads, when I told them I was going, I started writing down when I first arrived a lesson I'd learned, something I'd learned on, you know, like from like Johnny Matt said something or Leo said something. I thought, God, that's a really interesting point. I never thought of it that way before. And uh, so I started that uh, with lesson one, whatever it was in you know 2016, and I'm on 158 now. I looked at my note, you know, wow. that's lessons from Leinster, lessons from coaching, lessons from being in a high performing environment daily. Winning, losing, um, and you know those lessons will be the ones I'll take with me, and hopefully, you know that's the experience piece that builds, doesn't it? You know, because you're doing it yeah, week yeah, in yeah. world. Is there any example of one of those lessons that I would understand? That's not just like stand <laughs> stand three meters to the left off scrum. Um, yeah, maybe maybe like like Leo, um, like we did a we all, we would all, always have a like a leadership meeting pre pre game. Um, and the players who are involved, the key decision makers, the lineup caller, the captain, you know, we'd have, we'd have that meeting pre game, uh, pre game, and they would drive the game. And Leo, quite rightly, said at the start of the season, why don't we, before we get going on the Monday, why don't we meet those leaders again and review the performance just as a as a little group before we do the team review? So we only have like ten or fifteen minutes there before you actually do the the overall review, but we can just gauge, you know, the mood and what they felt on the time and why decisions were made. And I've never really come across that in a in a sporting environment, and that was just a bit of Leo, you know. And so then, write it down. That's lesson number one hundred forty-seven. <laughs> Have a leadership meeting on the morning of uh, a Monday morning. Uh, a quote from October twenty fifteen. So this is just after the World Cup, and I'm, I look. People know at this stage the World Cup did not go well for for England, and there's the, all the fallout. And what you said in October twenty fifteen is, I don't think I'll ever come to terms with it personally because it was such a big thing. Have you come to terms with it? Um, obviously, it helps. It helps, you know, playing in a team that wins, and you know you've won trophies. But Roy Hodgson, who's the England coach at the time, he was uh, the England soccer coach at the time. Um, I'd met him a few times, um, and met him subsequently actually. Mm. And he said the thing is about sports. He says if you if you do lose your job or you get sacked, and he'd been through a few himself, he said it's like a scar. It 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 never truly heals, but it does fade with time. And that's probably the best way I can describe it, you know. Yeah. It'll never disappear, it'll always be part of you. Um, the disappointing thing is is that it sort of clouds, you know, the, the, the sort of two games, if you like, cloud so much progress that was made in four years. Um, and I think when I do go back to England, people, 
remember that. You know, they do talk about that a lot, right. and they're all like, you know, they're not like, oh my god, you know, is the guy. Um, but they're like, oh thanks, you know, you did a great job, and you know, you've given Eddie Jones a decent team, you know. Mm. Um, so, but yeah, no, it, it would never, it'd never disappear. But um, coaching a new team, um, winning and losing, you know, but being involved in a new team definitely helps heal yes. the scar. Less haunted by it, I suspect. Yeah, yeah. it's it was t- it's tough. It's tough, isn't it? You know, yeah. um, it would be tough. For, it's tough for any coach. Mm. It's not just me. The rugby world is a small one, and people talk, and there are uh, mumblings that the English union have reapproached you or did reapproach you and said, "Come back into the national setup." Is there a leading question? Next question. <laughs> um, Truth. There's, there's, there's a like people probably would assume I hadn't spoke to anyone from England at all, you know, during the last eight years, but that's not that's not the truth. You know, you've got um, a new CEO, Bill Sweeney, um, who's come in. And I think he, to be fair to Bill, you know, he recognises that, you know, I know a lot about English rugby, you know, both both as um, an academy manager, um, as a club coach at pre- a championship and premiership level, as an age grade coach, as in a runner of the academies, as a England Saxons coach, as an England coach, yeah. so he, kn- he he knows that, and obviously Connor as well, who came back into the high performance role. Um, uh, I know very well. You know, we sort of like our, our, our jobs have sort of flipped um, a couple of times. Um, so yeah, no, Bill and Connor I've spoken to. Um, in terms of the the role for England, clearly they're looking for someone post Eddie Jones who's going to finish, um, but it was never really a. Uh, a consideration. Why I don't not? Think. Why not say apps? That is the that is the what, job. Me, what, me. what? What? If you were England or if you were me? If I was you, would you? Oh, absolutely. You'd go back, and I'd show everyone. <laughs> I'd bloody show everyone. <laughs> absolutely. Were you not tempted? Uh, well, it was never really. A, you know, it was not. It was nothing that um, you'd put down as an offer by any stretch of imagination. Sure, but, but so, I would have. I would have. If but, I even got a hint, I would have. Okay, I'm going to go for that. I'm gonna do, what, what do I need to do to make that happen? I'm coming back to I'm coming back to my point about club rugby, international rugby, um, challenge of going to a different environment, doing something different. Um, that's a strong waiting for me, you know. I mean, I don't think, you know, I don't want the soundbite to be Stuart Lancaster's approach, England because he wasn't, you know. Sure. But but, you know, I've tried to help out with England where I can behind the scenes, um, not in a in a consistent way over the last eight years, but when they've asked. You know, some people might have said, "Well, why, why, why would you do that?" Like I'm like, "Well, my sons are through the system. I care about how the system works." Um, I would speak to quite a few of the current head coaches of the Premiership, mainly because I coach them. You know, so like yeah. a George Gimton at Gloucester, um, Lee Blackett, Wasps, Stuart Hooper, Dave Waldo I spoke to not so long ago. You know, there's there's plenty of coaches in England who I'd speak to, which I find rewarding. Yeah, yeah to be honest. Um, uh, and obviously, the, there's a curiosity in England, particularly with what's going on with the club country uh, relationship, um, and uh, and the Irish system. Like, why is why are Ireland doing so well? Like, what it's the what's the magic? Um, Turns out the, the 2015 World Cup group have done quite well. Yeah, well, that's, <laughs> but that's that's part of the thing, isn't it? You know, yeah. you 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 know, all four of us have got a lot of experience learned during that time, and so not only do you take all experience away. From, from England because we all sort of leave but you give it to the opposition you give it to to Ireland um, and Fazos he's done a you know a work under Joe done a brilliant job with the national team Catty as well Graham's down obviously now at Munster now he's you know you can see the transformation he's beginning to make there um, so so yeah it's uh, um, I don't know if it, it would happen in other sports but uh it's a, it's a great. Rub, rub, is a, yeah, yeah, is a fun, in, it's a fun. In, well, in too many sports, it's like well, you'll ne- you'll never work again, and you're 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 sullied, and you're you're finished. But the American yeah. footballs maybe talk about actually the they want a coach who's failed once, you know. To fair enough. That's the, I'm sure you're a yeah. better coach for it, you know. Definitely. Well, that's interesting. So look to stress, there was not some hard concrete offer on the table from England, but there was a conversation and potential opening, and it, I don't know. It's, uh, it's, well, uh, no, I wouldn't even say that. I mean, I wouldn't okay. even say that, Joe. I don't think it's too strong. Uh, you know. Like the conversation is more about like what's your view on the club country relationship and everything else, okay. you know. Um, uh, you know, I'm, and for me, like when you're talking about the considerations, someone's gonna have to like turn my head to to leave, to leave Leinster and and Racing managed to do that yeah. in the way in which they did it. You know, I'm not gonna go and throw my hat in the ring to to coach England again when there's, 
Um, there's plenty of good people out there, you know, Steve Balthwick and you know, Rob Baxter and these guys, mm. the strong candidates. Do you think you'll go into international coaching in, I don't know, 10 years when you fancy a slower pace of life? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know that delicate. Uh, I was, was going to say, <laughs> tell Andy, Andy Farrell, you know, it's going to be a slow pace of life in the next four <laughs> weeks. It's a bit like, uh, you know, international coaching, it is a bit like, like riding a wave, you know, there's like a tsunami coming out here and then, then suddenly there's this calm period and then it comes again. Mm. You know, the, one of the challenges of rugby union, being a coach of rugby union, is the is the grey areas of the sport that often you can't control, you know. And I know no coach can control ultimately the outcome of any event. But but in rugby union, you know, there's there's a lot of influence that the referee can have on the outcome of games and, you know. Um, so international coaching, you know, you, 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 you're riding the tightrope. Yeah. You're riding the tightrope and... Um, you know, I've been burnt once by that experience. Um, would I do it again? I definitely wouldn't say never. Um, does it have to be England or Ireland? Not necessarily, no. I mean, if, if I was being honest, I'd, I'd love to coach in some capacity in the Southern Hemisphere mm. at some point. Mm. Um, and then maybe do full circle and come back. But, uh, you know, that's what I'd like to do ultimately, is just keep coaching over the course of the next five to ten years or whatever, and then really sort of pass on what I've learned to other coaches. I get a real sense of enjoyment um, by doing that. Uh, one last area to touch on. Your relationship with Leo Cullen, clearly it's paid huge dividend. Um, I presume you can't agree on everything at every moment. And you said he picks the team ultimately. And, and so how do you handle those moments where I see it very differently to you and I think you're wrong, but ultimately fine. Do what you want to do and not storm out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> Be petulant. Well, that's it. That's the art of being a good number two, isn't it? You know, the art of being a good number two really is, and, and this is what I'm hoping I'll get in in France, you know, is that you've got someone who'll check and challenge and support and debate, but ultimately, you know, someone has to make a decision at some point and then your job is to make the decision work. Yeah. Like, there's nothing worse than have, working with someone who who does that. You know, you, you have the, the conversation and you give your opinion and then you as the leader make the decision and then the person then goes off in a strop because they've not, you're not taking their view yeah. on board. So I've definitely tried not to be that person. Um, and how often would there be a, oh, I sort of, I see it. Yeah, the, yeah there'd, be, there'd be that, you know, and it wouldn't just be me, like Robin would have a view on the forward sure. selection, um, Andrew Goodman now would have a view on the back selection. And we'd all sort of put it into the mix. Um, but then ultimately Leo makes the call and we all go, right, okay, job, right, let's get well, on with it's it. It's obviously worked incredibly well. To, yeah, yeah, but you know, I mean, I think, I think my account. personal relationship with Leo is... is, is Pretty unique in that we have we're, we're very similar personalities, you know, very very similar, really, um, very similar values, very similar sort of thoughts on the game. He's very studious, you know. He's he's got good integrity. He wants to learn and develop. He's curious. Mm. He's passionate about Leinster. Um, so, no, from minute one, from literally from minute one, from the day I walked into his office and he said, "Oh, would you like to come?" Mm. You know, we've never really had a crossword, if you've been honest. You know, there's been occasional times where I've gone, well, I think we should do this, and he's gone, well, we're doing that. I'm going, okay, well, fine, let's crack on with it. And is it a just a very professional relationship, or has it become a friendship? Would you go for dinner together? Would you socialise uh, together? Well, we wouldn't, not that we wouldn't socialise outside of work because we, we, you know, we don't like each other, more because, you know, he's got his family stuff, and I'm usually flying back to, to, to England sure. or, or whatever. Um, but no, no, he knows um, a lot. Uh, about me as a person, you know, that other people wouldn't know, definitely. Um, you know, personal stuff and challenges or whatever. As I say, you know, he's the first person getting on a plane to my dad's funeral and mm -hmm. he's never met my dad. Um, so, you know, he knows who my brothers and sisters are, he knows who my wife is, he knows who my mum is, you know, and that's way beyond a professional relationship, isn't it? Yeah. Um, in the same way that, you know, he'd invite me around and I know his kids and Tarina and his family. Um, in fact, my mum and dad, mum and dad came across. Leo's mum and dad took them and took them on a tour around Wicklow and did the whole thing, you know. So which is great. Wow, lovely. which is great. Yeah, yeah. So, so no, I think when you work together in a in an environment, well, in in any sporting environment, really, uh, where it's full time, you know, spend a lot of time together. You can't ever get to know each other um, on a deeper level than than you maybe would do in a in a different. I'm sure. And 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 like what's so brilliant about it is, and it's been much commented upon. I'm sure you've seen people say it down the years. He had to show great humility in bringing someone of your stature in and often you're talked about in, in glowing terms and overshadow him on television post-match conversations and equally you have to show humility to go from being head coach of a national side to 
I disagree with that decision, but you're the boss, you make the decision. On both parts there, there's a lovely amount of give and take. Yeah. Quite rare, I would think. Yeah, yeah, possibly. I mean, you know, Leo is very humble. Very humble. Like, you know, I had to force him to have a photo with a it was it was uh, the uh, one of the finals and we'd won a trophy and I said come on let's have a photo he said no 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 it's not it's the players I said come on Leo we're having a, <laughs> we're having a photo here <laughs> like you had to try to drag him and say come on uh, but um, yeah no he's very humble okay. very humble so there's no yeah he's that's why he'll he'll always be successful because he's genuinely a good person how do you assess the six years with Leinster then is it a, a case of you can't win them all and it's been it's been incredibly consistent, incredibly good, or with the Saracens, La Rochelle defeats, a, a nagging sense of what could have been? Both. Both, Both definitely. Are definitely. you more, more in one camp than the other? Um, yeah, no, I think, I think, you know, the progression of the group, you know, the evolution of young players to become international players, the watching them perform so well against... New Zealand, you know, recently it was such a sense of pride, you know, with so many players who you've coached for so long mm. to achieve that that achievement, you know, um, was was amazing. That was that was amazing, you know. So there's so many, me- and even like when you've got a young player who maybe doesn't play for go on to play for Ireland, but they play for Leinster and or they make the debut and they're successful and the what the impact it has. So that that way way overshadows the the discipline. in sport. You can't win everything, you know. There's no, I mean. As much as you'd love to, there's not a coach I've met who's not gone through the bitter pull of defeat in a in a big game. Yeah. Um, of course, you know the last play of a European Cup final hurts big time. You know losing the final against Saracens, you know hurts big time. Um, but the the pros so far outweigh those yeah. those cons. You know the excitement that we that we of the rugby we play, the way the crowd gets lifted at the RDS. Um, or, or I mean, like we had a game against the Sharks a couple of weeks ago. It was, it was honestly, it was absolutely amazing. It was brilliant, and we played one game in the RDS against Toulouse, um, and again, like, it's very hard to replicate that and what it feels like in the changing room after the game, you know. So that's what you're constantly striving for as a coach. You just want that changing room feeling, you know, to sit there with a the beer, thinking, job done, you know. And I've had the um, fortune to be able to sat there many times with Leinster. And not just the big European games, but sometimes you're taking a young team away and you're beating a, I don't know, a difficult team away from home and, you know, it's it's as rewarding as well. So, yeah, you know, you'd, you'd love to win them all. Um, unfortunately, we haven't. Uh, but the motivation for me personally is massive for this year. You know, clearly, the European Cup Finals in Dublin, mm. the fifth star, this loss in the semi-final of the URC against the Bulls, still great, um, big time. Mm. So there's plenty to strive for and, um, yeah, there's no lacking in motivation in me for, or, or anyone in the group, for sure. Well, hopefully a fitting finale to your time in Leinster. Um, thank you so much for coming in and talking so honestly about so many things. It was uh, a great pleasure. I should say our rugby and off the ball is with thanks to Vodafone, main sponsor of the Irish rugby team. We all belong to the team of us. The very best of luck for the rest of the season and then enjoy Paris. Hope it's uh, lots of fun and more. Stuart Lancaster, thank you. Excellent.